Hi everyone, welcome to M3 Center Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhyiddin Kavsoğlu and I'm a PhD candidate in adult education. I'm doing my dissertation specifically on hospitality and tourism education. I'm honored to be an adjunct instructor at the College of Hospitality and Tourism Leadership. I'm also very excited to teach Introduction to Hospitality and Tourism course. And all of my students are here. Can you please raise your hands so everyone can recognize you, my students? Thank you so much. For this course, I plan to have three guest speakers and three field trips to give the real perspective of hospitality and tourism to my students. So this will be the second guest speaker for this course. I would like to thank Mike, uh, Mr. Mike Lester, the president of Melting Pot, for taking his time and attending this lecture series. Before his speech, I would like to invite Dr. Jihan Kobanov, he is the director of the M3 Research Center, to tell us a few words about the M3 Research Center. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, we're going to turn down the sound a little bit. And also, okay, perfect. Um, as Muitin said, my name is Dr. Jihan Trabalolo. I'm the director of the M3 Center, which is the Center for Hospital Technology and Innovation at the USF uh, Sarasota Vanity. Our hospital school usually, uh, I mean, it's easy in Sarasota, uh, but we offer this class here, Muitin's class. Uh, therefore, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, M3 Center uh, is a research center. Uh, we do a lot of different activities in the M3 Center, and uh, one of which is to have distinguished speakers like Mr. Mike Lester to come and speak, share with us. Usually we use webinar, so our guest speakers could be any place in the world, but because today he's right here in local in Tampa, so we wanted to have him in person, which we are so grateful to have him. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our Dean, Dean for the College of Hospitality and Tourism Leadership at USF Sarasota Humanity, Dr. Pat Morio, to introduce Mr. Mike Lester. Dr. Pat? Thank you. I have to move this down. I, I, I am standing on it. I just thought I'd tell everybody that. Um, it's, a, it's wonderful to see you all here. I'll start with a shameless advertisement. The shameless advertisement is that we are opening a branch of the College of Hospitality and Tourism Leadership here on the USF Tampa campus, and we're opening another branch on the USF St. Petersburg campus. So it will be one College of Hospitality and Tourism Leadership geographically dispersed. And probably, I, unless people wanted to, they probably wouldn't have to come down to Sarasota. Even for the lab courses, we're, we're going to make arrangements to do all those here. So, some of, most of you in this class I know are already committed to a major, and that's fine. Um, but if you're not, or tell your friends about it, it's okay. And uh, we'd love to have you join us. We'd like to welcome the students in the back of the room. I don't know why they all sat in the back. But these are our certificate program students from the uh, hotel school, hotel and restaurant school in Taiwan called Enkut. And uh, it's a wonderful university. The whole university is devoted to hospitality. So give me a welcome. <laughs> and that leads me into Mike Lester. And so he is on our board of advisors, which we are very grateful for. And uh, he is president and CEO of Melting Pot. He's going to tell you all about that company. It's a, it's a, it's a great concept that they have figured out how to, how to take nationally. Uh, but he was with Outback Steakhouses, Steakhouses for many years and developed uh, those concepts as well and partnered with folks to expand uh, operations there. He graduated in Kentucky with microbiology. It's okay, there's hope for microbiologists to, uh, to do something Very useful. Huh? Very clean restaurants. Very clean restaurants. <laughs> so without further ado, let's give a warm USF welcome to Mike Lester. Pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I did go to school at the University of Kentucky and I was seeking a degree in microbiology. And I absolutely had zero desire to get into the restaurant business at that time. I remember 
I was working in restaurants since the time um, I was 14 years old, started as a dishwasher at a Red Lobster in our town. And uh, I think we broke some labor laws even back then, even though it was a stone age, because I, I don't think I was really allowed to be working those hours, but I did. I had no desire, and then it just kind of bit me. The hospitality bug bit me, and I realized I liked serving people. I liked making people happy. I liked this business. Uh, it was energetic. It was engaging. It was challenging. I liked it. I liked it a lot. And I had no idea that I was going to like it as much as, uh, as I thought. Um, I remember even uh, I was thinking about, okay, what am I going to do now? I've worked in this lab researching uh, genetics uh, with, uh, with microbiology. We're doing this great research at the University of Kentucky Medical Center. And I'm still working in the, as a bartender at night. I said, what am I going to do with all of this? And I'm going to have to go back to school. I'm going to have to reevaluate my life. What am I going to do? And my general manager at that time said, well, listen, you love this business. Why don't you become a manager? You can you know, kind of build your resume. You worked every position in the restaurant. You can build your resume and then figure out what you want to do with your life. So that was the plan. I was going to become a manager, interview for a management position, and, and then figure out after a year or two of that what I wanted to do with my life. That was 32 years ago. <laughs> and I'm still doing that. It was supposed to be a two-year plan. I'm still doing it today because I got bit by that hospitality bug. I worked, that was a seafood restaurant that I worked in, a place called Ellen and Seafood Grill, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, that was a delicious concept, New Orleans-based fresh from scratch kitchen. Um, if you think bonefish, it, it's kind of like what a bonefish is today. Uh, then I went to Outback Steakhouse uh, in their early days. I joined that company when they only had the one brand and they had less than 100 restaurants. Uh, and I helped uh, develop and expand and run their Northern Ohio uh, division. And my region was from Toledo to Cleveland, Akron, Canton, all the way to Youngstown. I have basically the northern half of the state down to Columbus, but not including Columbus, and was running and developing 15 restaurants for them. And Outback was a great 14 years, a very cultured organization. Friends of mine are still in that organization. I can't tell you uh, enough nice things about them. 12 years ago, more than 12 years ago, though, I, I thought about, okay, what's next? What's the next challenge for me? And I met uh, the owners of Melting Pot, Bob and Mark Johnston. Um, they started the, or bought the concept really from some founders, and I'll talk to you about that in the history. But I started uh, as the Vice President of Restaurant Operations, uh, where I started implementing systems and tools, and I was in charge of the training department, the research and development department, and they would say, hey, can you run the purchasing department? I said, well, I've never done that before, but I'll, I'll give it a shot, you know, and, and I started running the purchasing department, still do actually to this day. Um, and then I was promoted to Senior Vice President of Operations, and then six years ago they honored me with the, the title of President. Uh, and I do mean that, that it's an honor. Uh, Melting Pot started in Florida in 1975. It was a, it's a, we're a franchise organization. In a few moments I'm going to talk to you about what a franchise organization is in the restaurant business and kind of tell you some pros and cons about that. Can I do a franchising 101 if I can? <clears throat> but we're a franchisor. Uh, we have 115 restaurants, 112 are franchised. We have three company operated locations in Sarasota, St. Petersburg, and Pensacola. Uh, and the rest are franchise. So uh, we're in 34 states and five countries. We have uh, Middle East and Canada and Mexico and then developing in other countries as we speak. So um, by show of hands, who's been in the melting pot? All right, so not that many. Well, we are a unique interactive dining experience. Uh, we bring, we're all about fondue. Really, no one competes with us in this experience. We make the cheese and chocolate fondues at the table. We melt the cheese, we'll, we make it at the table, then we bring a fresh salad, and then we do an entree fondue. Entree fondue means that you cook it at the table. We bring you unprepared meats that are cut up into pieces with marinades and rubs and lots of sauces. And you cook it yourself at the table. And then of course we finish with delicious chocolate fondue. And what's interesting about that, I'll throw out one quick statistic. Does anybody, give me a guess. I like to ask questions. So give me a guess what the average national restaurant system would love as a percentage of their guests to order dessert or appetizer. Throw that number. Nobody's, I won't ready to go, I promise. Ralph, 10%. 10%? 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%
10%, okay? That's actually pretty close, on desserts especially. What else? 18? Pretty close. And that's really interesting. I was on a panel discussion with the executive chef at uh, a multi-unit food service operators conference with the executive chef of Cheesecake Factory. And cheesecake is in their name. And guess what percentage of their guests order cheesecake? 25%. 80% of melting pot guests get appetizer and dessert. 73% of our guests get all four courses of cheese fondue, salad, entree fondue, and chocolate fondue. And that's a, that's a statistic that most restaurants would die for. You know, I can tell you my former brands that I represented, we were lucky to have 6% to your 10%. We were lucky to have 6% of our guests have a dessert. And uh, here, Melting Bite just takes that, and we just, that's been that way ever since we've opened the doors in 1975. All right, let's keep going. So I wanted to show you a picture. This is kind of the dining experience. This is centered around the fondue pot right here, right? This is the cheese fondue has already been made. We give you a variety of different items, fondue forks, and you just kind of dip in with the cheese. You cook your entree in there, and, and that's how the experience goes. What's really cool about our brand is that when you dine there, most people today when they're at restaurants are on their phones, right, all the time. When you go to the melting pot, you look around, and the only time the phone comes out is if somebody's taking a picture of our food, and then the rest of the time the food is put or the phone is put down. So we're the cell phone killer. So people go and they experience each other's company and they engage with one another, and they're not on their phones unless they're taking pictures of the food. That's our first melting pot in Maitland, Florida. It actually started here in Florida back in 1975 by two guys named Roy and Bruce. So Roy and Bruce, you know. Fondue was hot in the 70s. Anybody's parents have fondue sets in their closets? I've got a couple in my closet, even before I started working for Melting Pot. But uh, it was really hot in the 70s. Has anybody been to a fondue party that hasn't been to Melting Pot? Have you ever hosted, or been hosted uh, for a fondue party? It's a lot of work. So that's why Roy and Bruce said, hey, we're gonna do the work for our guests, because it's really engaging experience. Everybody loves it. We're gonna do the work for our guests. And we're going to do the dishes for everybody afterwards. But these guys started, they opened this restaurant for $5,000. But they ran out of money at the end, and they only had enough money to build one table. <laughs> one single table. So what they had to do, their first day of business, is they opened up that door. You see the little padlock there. They opened it up. They let one table in, and then locked the door. And then, and then of course, we have the chocolate fondue at the end. And they were struggling, they were going by and things were happening and there was a buzz, but not a big buzz. One of the, one of the interesting things is they started the restaurant, there was a local council person in, in Maitland who objected to the name. And so they, they went to the council, the council asked them to come explain the name, the melting pot. And believe it or not, they said, hey, the melting pot, the melting pot brings kind of an, un, this is their words, not mine, an undesirable element in that name. So they said, we're not sure we're gonna allow you to use that name. So you gotta to come to this council meeting and explain the name. So they went to the council meeting thinking, well, what, we can't fight City Hall, so you know we're gonna to have to change the name. But what happened was the community, and it's a diverse community around Maitland, the community heard about that and they packed the City Hall. And one person after the other, after the other, went forward and talked about you know, how it was, it was a, quite an honor to, for a restaurant to honor the integrity of, of the United States and us being the melting pot of the, of the world where everybody can come together, all these different cultures can come together. And that was an honor to that. And that why would the council have an objection to that? Well, ultimately, after hours of people speaking, the council voted five to one. That one guy was still a holdout, five to one to allow the name because the community came forward. So we are, we are a project of our community. And then, so that made some local news, and then so the local food editor of the, of the Orlando Sentinel, I'm not sure if it was called the Sentinel at the time, yeah, it was Sentinel Star, uh, came by and they did a, a front page story, front page of the entertainment section story about that. And that's when business took off. They, they didn't know what to do, they started hiring people, and they, they were pretty much their own staff, and they started hiring a bunch of people, and, and things started taking off. And, they expanded into another space next to them, 
added a bunch more tables. I think at that point they got up to 20 different tables and things were happening for them. This was around 70, yeah, late 1975. So I want to pause for a second and just kind of go into a little bit of franchising 101 for you because I think it's important to understand how we grew. We went from those simple beginnings of Roy and Bruce and we decided when Bob and Mark bought the company that we wanted to grow through franchising. There's a lot of different ways uh, restaurant companies can grow. One way is they can get some you know, private equity to help them grow and infuse some capital and so they can go into debt. They can you know, borrow a lot of money. Uh, or they can choose to grow through franchising. And so and that's Bob and Mark cho chose to grow through franchising. So what is franchising? Well, basically franchising is a marketing system revolving around a two-party agreement whereby the franchisee conducts business according to the terms specified by the franchisor. We're a franchisor. We have an operating model. We have recipes. We have uh, service guidelines. We have training support, marketing support. We have uh, construction and design support. We have $35 million of spend under contract for our franchising, driving costs down for them because we pull our buying power, um, <clears throat> and many, many other areas of support. Um, so that's what we're doing as a franchisor. A franchisee is somebody who's an entrepreneur whose power is limited by the contractual agreement with the franchisor. They get all the benefits, and I'll show you kind of the chart that I created. They get all the benefits of the experience of the franchisor, but they also get some limitations, and we'll talk about that. And uh, we're the franchisor, we're the party in the franchise contract that specifies the methods to be followed and the terms to be met by the other party. Why is it important for a franchisor to specify standards and methods? This is interactive. Somebody yell it out. It's, was it, they worked before, so we want to keep the pattern. All right, so you have a higher likelihood of success, right? All right, why else? That's good. Take care of the name. What's that? Take care of the name. Take care of the name. When, I, when you say name, what you really mean is the brand, right? So if, if one of our franchisees in a city doesn't execute well, it gives everybody a bad, it gives all of the melting pots a, a bad name. Right, and it, it damages the brand. So we actually have, as the franchisor, we have a contractual obligation with all of our franchisees to make sure that not one, that no franchisee damages the brand by performing in a poor fashion. Does that make sense? Because it hurts everybody. The whole, the whole brand suffers when that happens. So again, what, what are you doing? You're basically, you're buying success. You're buying, to your point, you're right? You're buying a proven model. You're buying a lower failure rate. You're buying a, you know, a flattened learning curve. You can learn what to do very, very quickly. Uh, you get training, you get, and by the way, lenders. Lenders love franchising because it's a proven model. So they'll, they're more likely, banks are more likely to lend you money when you are signing up for a proven model. Uh, you have operational support, you have marketing co-ops, and you have support there as well. So what are some of the drawbacks though? Some of the drawbacks are you get a franchise fee. Typically, a franchise fee is anywhere between, uh, uh, depending on how complicated the restaurant is, anywhere between as low as twenty to as high as sixty or seventy thousand dollars. Ours is forty-five thousand. What does a fran franchise fee buy you? It buys you uh, the training support at your opening. It buys you your own personal training. It buys you all of the things that you need, all the expertise that you need in which to open up your restaurant. <clears throat> you also have a royalty. Royalties average between three and 6% of sales, right? Some I've heard go higher. Ours currently is four and a half percent of sales. So for every dollar of uh, fondue or our franchisee sell, we get four and a half cents of that. That's going actually up in the, in the next five to 10 years. Uh, that's gonna go up to 5%. Industry average for full service restaurants is between five and six. We've always been below the industry average. At co-op fees, that's when you pull, like all the subways in the market pull all their money together and they buy TV. Because one little restaurant can't, they don't have enough money to buy a TV commercial, but when you pull all your money together and you, and you create a cooperative, you have to pay into that and, you, and that's mandatory. So those average anywhere between one and 6%, the average is probably between two and four. And they vary greatly. Ours is actually very low because we don't have like subways or some quick casual restaurants we don't have market, we don't have geographic density because although we have 115 restaurants, they're dispersed all over the country. So it's hard for us to buy medium. 
Investment costs are typically around 600000 for a quick serve or up to $2 million if you buy a full service franchise because you have to get a liquor license. In New Jersey, for instance, it's, uh, we just recently bought a liquor license in New Jersey and paid $700,000 for one liquor license. The state of Florida for a four COP is about 2500 for a liquor license. I mean, that's the difference between the different states. Uh, our FDD, I have to give you this disclosure because our franchise disclosure document, we are regulated, franchising is regulated by FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. So we have to be very clear about what we say uh, to prospective people who might be interested in a franchisee. So I have to tell you, our sheet says between 1.2 million and 1.8 million for an investment standard. So what are some of the restrictions? We have to follow the standards. You can't cook what you want. You know, if you own a Burger King, you can't put a quarter pounder with cheese on your menu. You're not allowed to do that. You have to only put on your menu what Burger King says you can put on your menu. You have a lot less autonom autonomy. You still own that business, but you still have to follow the very strict standards of the franchisor. And you can lose your business if you don't follow the rules. So that's kind of a serious restriction. Again, here's the chart that I made for you. When you talk about initial responsibilities, very low for a franchisee, but if you're an independent branch, it's very high. You have, you have to do everything. But for a franchisee, you have a lot of support. Creative control, you get very, uh, you get very little uh, creative control as a franchisee because you have to follow the systems and standards of the franchise. But if you're an independent, you can choose anything you do. If money, actually you require a little bit less money as an independent restaurant to open than a franchise. Because franchise, you have certain standards on opening. So independents went out a little bit more that way. And for experience, you have to have very little experience as a franchisee because the franchise is going to teach you everything you need to know to open that restaurant and support you along the way and give you guidance and field operations support after that. For an independent, you better know what you're doing. This is the reason why a lot of restaurants fail in the first 12 months is because a lot of people jump into it and they don't know what they're doing. And that's where if you don't know what you're doing, you can, you can a lot of times your first exposure to the restaurant business, it's a good idea to do a franchise. So you can get your eyes on that. So this is how we grew. I want to talk a little bit about culture because this is when Roy Bruce started the company and they worked it up to about five restaurants or something like that. And that's when Mark Johnston, who was a server at that original melting pot in Maitland, Florida, and he was going to UCF. He was a soccer player and he, it wasn't called UCF back then, I don't know what it's called. But he was working his way through college, and, and he, at the end of college, just really wanted to be a franchisee. So he actually talked his older brother, Mike, into going into business with him, and they started their very first melting pot in Tallahassee, and then expanded to the Carrollwood one, uh, and they've opened several more. And then Mike uh, and Mark brought their younger brother, Bob, who's our current CEO, Bob Johnson's our current CEO, into the business as well. And then they bought, the three of them bought the company from Roy and Bruce. Roy and Bruce were great. They love they loved creating things, but they didn't want to grow it. They didn't want to run it. They just, you know, they, they were ready to let somebody else have kind of that drudgery of everyday work to, to grow something like that. Um, so Mark, Mark and Bob and Mike bought it. You can see their first 10 years though, they struggled. I mean, from 1984 to 1994, they only went from 5 to 20 units. Why that's important is because during that 10-year time, Patrick and, and some of us older people can tell you, in, in the restaurant chain environment, chains were exploding at that time. Outback Steakhouse started in 1988. When I joined their company from 1988 to 1991, they had over 100 restaurants by the end of 1991. And today they have over 800 restaurants and five different five different brands, I think it is. Um, they have over 800 Outbacks and 300 Carabas. I can't remember how many, but they have a lot of restaurants. So during the same time that they got, uh, in three years, they got 100 restaurants. In 10 years, we went from five to 20. So that, that growth was very anemic. And we were really struggling. We didn't know why, because so we thought people loved us. But what we learned here is about our culture. We didn't, we didn't have a culture. We read an article, actually it was about Outback, Chris Sullivan, in Harvard Business Review. Um, 
And then if you've read the book Good to Great, it espouses much of the same principles. If you're not a culture or principled organization, you don't tend to thrive as much as those who are. Now, Mark, Bob, and Mike had great values. I mean, they were good people, but they, they always set, they had this idea, well, that's business, and, and this is who we are personally. They kept trying to have two different personas, and they tried to be these, pardon my French, these, these really tough business people, but, you know, they tried not to mingle their business and personal lives. But when they learned that we needed to be a value-based organization, they said, oh, well, we have these values personally. Let's just infuse our personal values into our business and then that's what happened. We created, I'll show you on the next slide, what we created, we created a culture, we rolled it out to all of our franchisees. We even gave away a car when we introduced it. And that's when they introduced it. That, this is what TGS is, Total Guest Satisfaction. That was the title of our culture back then. And they went from 20 to more than 120 in the next 10 years because of that. It had everything to do with the values that we were teaching our team members, our managers, our new franchisees. If you didn't align with these values, you were not going to be a part of our organization. That's, I mean, super important. Here's what our card looks like today. It's the melting pot culture. We call it the mission, vision, and principles. It's driven by a focus, strong mission, and vision. We have 10 different principles. We have five different stakeholders. We make commitments to all of them, and we tell them, this is what we're going to do for you. For our team members, we promise you that we're going to be a great place to work. For our vendors, we promise you that you're going to be proud of our relationship together. And those are the kinds of things that we did. And, and people all of a sudden were attracted to us. They said, hey, we want to be a part of that organization. That sounds good. I want to be a part of that group. And we grew. So that's how we got, I'm really skipping because, I mean, we're a 44-year-old brand, so to cover 44 years in 90 minutes is, is really tough to do. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leapfrog a little bit, so I'm gonna jump about 20 more years here in the future. So I wanna talk about brand evolution a little bit. And that's really important. The, the people who, raise your hands who ate a melting pot again. When was the last time you actually ate at one? Two years ago. Two years? Six months. Six months? Like two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. You're hired. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Long time. I had two years, one year. Typically when I ask that question of an audience, I get I get most of the answers are like here, which is in the years. I ate there two years ago. It's my favorite place to celebrate a birthday, but I'm only gonna celebrate every other year. Our average diner only dines with us every I'm sorry, 1.8 times a year. We've increased that recently to 2.3. That's not a lot of frequency. And they, and they view Melting Pot for these kind of special occasions, either romance, boyfriend, girlfriend, or whatever, romantic night with your significant other, or for a celebration, a birthday, anniversary, graduation, something like that. They, they view us uh, for these special events. But we have this whole core group of loyal guests that will dine with us every week. But the bulk of our guests and consumer base only dines with us a couple times a year. And that's just not good enough. We have to do better in this really competitive landscape in the restaurant environment. So we've, we've tried to do a lot of brands have tried to do, right? And I love to show slides like this. When you look at, you're talking about, you know, the, the, the company, right? And the brand and, and the name. Well, Look at, look at all the iterations of logos every one of these really big companies have had over the years. And do you know we're only, Melting Pot's only on our third logo? 44 years and we're only on our third logo. Yet all these other companies continue to iterate and, and grow and innovate and evolve. So good brands evolve or they die. I had the honor of, of listening to uh, David Novak, former CEO, chairman of Young Brands, uh, who was you know, KFC, Taco Bell. And um, during his tenure at Young, the, the company doubled to 41,000 units under his leadership. His message about brand growth and brand relevance, he said, all right, here's, it's really simple. This business that we're in is really not that difficult to conceive or to understand. It's hard work, but it's not difficult to comprehend. He says, what you do is you talk to your guests, talk to your customers, and ask them, what are the one or two things you want us to do differently? And then go change them. 
just go change it and go fix it. So it's really basic when you think about that. So, you know, we did that. We started really, we've always listened to our guests. So we really started listening to our guests in a whole new way. I mean, we got really aggressive about it. So what do we do? Well, we created focus groups. I actually attended every single one of the focus groups, three different focus groups in uh, five different cities. So a total of 15 different focus groups inside the melting pot. We did, we broke down the, the customers into three different groups. People who had never tried melting pot before, the never tried, the lapsed users, which are the guests who, like you, haven't been in more than a year, right? So that was our delineation. And then the loyalists, the people that dine with us three to four times a year or more. And we had different kind of scenarios. What was really interesting is they told us a lot of the same stuff. We hired an outside independent cons consultant. I didn't. I was not introduced as the president of the brand at the time. I took on, I kind of took on a role. I acted as if I was a consultant as well. Because we wanted those people to be truthful and not try to, you know, hold back on their truthful comments about what they thought about our brand. It was a very significant undertaking, a huge amount of research on top of that. We, la we launched a quantitative study where we had over 70, we reached out to more than a million people and over 70,000 surveys submitted over the internet. The survey itself was more than 60 questions asking them about what do you think about our brand? So what did they say? Well, all right, let's talk about that. Here are the three main objections that we heard, and maybe you all agree with them, maybe you don't. Number one was the price. They perceived our value not to be there. They said it's too expensive. Time, it takes too long. If you dine at Melting Pot, for those of you who've been to Melting Pot, it's an hour and a half to two and a half hour dining experience. You're not going to go in and, and eat in 45 minutes or less. It just doesn't happen. And then the last thing, thankfully, a much smaller group, they said, you know, we don't always want to cook our own entree. We love the cheese and the chocolate and the salad, but the entree we're having a little trouble with. We're not exactly sure about whether or not we want to cook our own entree. So... The other interesting thing there at the end is he said, but here, here's the thing. If you want us to dine more often, you gotta address these three things, but here's the thing. Don't you dare mess with the brand. I still wanna celebrate. I still wanna use you for our romantic occasions. I still wanna use you for our special occasions of graduations, birthdays, anniversaries, and the like. So don't you take away anything, but you need to add these other things on top of it. You need to layer on top of it. So we started what, we call the Future Vision Restaurant. And we started doing a lot of work designing and ideating and studying this. And most of it happened in the lab. And we just opened up three months ago our very first restaurant in Red Bank, New Jersey. Our second one was opened up two months ago in El Paso. And I've got three under construction and 13 more in development. So what are we doing about it? Well, these are some of the things we want to take a look at. We need a new design. Our, our, our experience that we offer our guests is kind of cool, right? No, where do you, else do you go for that kind of fine new experience? It's very neat. People love the experience. We're, we get high marks on guest metrics for the experience. But we need a facility or a restaurant that actually feels like the coolness of the experience that people have. The facilities look kind of old. We also need new day parts. This is something full service restaurants are doing all over the country right now. It's, it's pretty tough to make a, a penny of profit in the restaurant business in this day and age. It really is. All the costs are increasing, certainly labor costs, insurance, benefits, uh, food. Every, I mean, there's just no relief. Nowhere on the P&L statement, there's no relief anywhere on the P&L statement right now. So we've got we've to add day parts because if we had this capital expense, we were only open dinner only. And so we're open six hours a day, 18 hours a day, this thing that took us 1.2 to $1.8 million to build a city vacant 18 hours a day, not producing revenue for us. That used to work. It doesn't work as well anymore. That's why you're seeing a lot of Outback Steakhouses and Caravas uh, open for lunch now, where if they're in areas that is a viable lunch crowd. So it's just, you know, the business model has changed. Dinner only used to work for a lot of people, and now you're having to add additional day parts. Well, if you're gonna add additional day parts, you better have menu items that are compelling and that will attract people to wanna to eat them during that. Right, you can't have a two hour lunch, unless you're Patrick maybe, I guess. 
Only when I'm with Gina. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> so you can't have a two-hour lunch. You, I better create a lunch menu where people can come be in and out in less than 45 minutes. So you've got to have, you know, you've got to have something out on the outside of the building signifying to your guests that something is different on the inside. So that's a new logo. So we have to have a new logo. You have to have additional revenue opportunities for franchise owners because if we're going to ask them to spend all this money remodeling their restaurants, it's got to be there's got to be a return on that investment. And we have to have increased options and flexibility for our customer, the consumer. So. Here are some pictures of existing melting pots today. Lots of heavy wood, very dark, very cut off, very compartmentalized. And you go in and you just kind of feel like you're in always a small room. Even though the average size melting pot is about 5,500 square feet, which is a decent sized restaurant, it feels small to our customer because it's so compartmentalized. And that's, we got to do something different about that. So what do you guys think about this design? You like that? Yeah. It's a little different. The theory here of something like this is we want to capitalize on our traditional melting pot experience. If our average unit volume is X, what can we do if we don't take that away? Because the guest, the consumer said, don't you dare take this classic experience away. What can we do if we say, all right, let's have a bar cafe experience. Let's have a casual dining area where people feel comfortable with lunch and brunch. Let's do a patio where it makes sense and parts of the country where it makes sense and then shopping centers or developments where it makes sense. And let's turn our, our host area, our front door area, into a revenue producer with retail offerings that people can buy and take home some, some other favorite treats from melting pot. Right now, that's an area that just costs money, doesn't, doesn't produce any, any revenue at all. Let's turn it into a revenue center. So if we take all of these four, this, this patio, the bar cafe, the casual, and the retail area, and layer that on top of that, what would that business model do? Would that look better or worse than our traditional? Obviously, I think that's an improvement. So I'm going to show you some pictures of some artist renderings. I'm going to show you what it looks like in real life. This is our cheese and chocolate kitchen. This is now out in the dining room. We want to make our cheese fondue and chocolate fondue in front of the guests. We have beautiful food. We have awesome ingredients. We want to do that in front of the consumer because we're proud of the food that we serve. Even in this raw and unprepped form, it looks beautiful, right? This is a, our new wine focal area where this is kind of adjacent to the bar where we'll have a, a table and these wine machines. And we've created a wine blending experience where we give a guest a little bit of Cabernet, a little bit of Merlot, and a little bit of Malbec, and we, and we teach them how to blend it together and they come up with their own percentages and they get the perfect red blend for themselves. It's kind of a cool experience where they can, and then we write down that recipe, the next time they come in, we'll make it for them, right? It's kind of cool. This is our new bar. What do you think of that? Did you go to a bar like that? <laughs> no. No, you wouldn't? I mean, when you were 21? Oh, I would go. I'd never been to a bar like oh, that. Man. Yeah. I will so, This is really interesting. This is the kind of collaborative experience that we had in creating this. And we had all kinds of stakeholders. We even had our office. We, we toured the country talking to our franchisees and their teams. And this right here, this back bar, these are all of our, our uh, mainstay cocktails. And inside these cubby holes are all the liquors and the glassware and the garnishes of each one of those. So you can look in that cubby hole and you go, oh, okay. The Love Martini has the peach and the vodka and the this that's served in that glass. You don't need to read the menu because you're seeing a visual representation of what that recipe is. And you know who thought of that? Our 22-year-old accounts receivable person. Has never worked in a restaurant a day in her life. But she thought of it. That's her idea. <laughs> I love it. And I could, I could name like those globes, that's somebody's idea, the, that artwork. I mean, there's probably, you know, hundreds of people's touches on this as we, as we embark upon this. We did add TVs. We don't want to be a sports bar, but people expect screens in restaurants these days, even nice restaurants. So uh, we added TVs, we have fresh garnish displays in the front. These are infused portals. Next, you'll see this area, this new thing, whiskey aged, or sorry, barrel aged cocktails. We're not just doing whiskey though, we also have some barrel aged uh, white liquors and vodka and things like that. Um, I had a guy in uh, our Red Bank location, we had him on video the other day, and his favorite drink is a Manhattan, and we've been barrel aging Manhattans, and they age 21 days before we serve it. 
And he said it was the best Manhattan he's been. I mean, this guy's in his 60s. He says, I've been drinking Manhattans all my life. This is the best Manhattan I've ever had in my entire life. And then we also want to have a little bit of tongue-in-cheek humor. This is a, a sign towards our restrooms. It's the please seat yourself restrooms. <laughs> you know, let's have a little fun while we're at it. <laughs> all right, and then this is our uh, main dining room slash party room. So we do, most of our melting pots have private dining rooms today, but they're not used very often. It's one of our least efficient pieces of real estate. The sales per seat in a private dining room in a melting pot is the lowest dollars. We analyze that than any other type of table in the restaurant. So we said, all right, we still want to accommodate large parties, but how can we do that with, with, without that? So we've created a much more flexible seating than we have. Here you see in uh, loose site uh, partitions come down from the ceiling and actually divide tables. And when they're up, you can have a top. When they're down, you have two four tops. And you have privacy because they come up and down. You can see some black and white uh, movies being cast on the, on the stone of the, of the fire feature. And just some really cool colors and finishes there. Do you like that? Yeah. yeah. Very much. All right. This is our casual area. Because again, if you're going to be open for lunch and brunch, you know, we actually had as a building design, we used to cover up windows for melting pots because we wanted that cozy feel. So now the new design is let's, let's add a lot more windows. And so this section of the area of the restaurant, high, super high ceilings, uh, lots of windows, lighter, brighter. And you can't tell it, but these tables are movable. And that's something, I know it's not, you know, you're like, so what? Restaurants move tables all the time. Not melting pot because we have cooktops burners wired in every table. So all of our tables across the country are bolted to the floor because there's electricity in them. Well, we figured out a way to have movable tables in a way that the, the, the building code people would allow. And it took us a long time to figure that out. So these tables can either be you know, two tops or you can push them together and have one big party. But you can see it's lighter, brighter, fun, real airy. All right, this is how it looks in reality. This is the new melting pot in Red Bank, New Jersey. Here's the kind of the casual side right here. Those, two, those tables are the movable ones I just told you about. They're put together right now for a party of eight where they can be four different two tops. That's the bar. We had the lower ceilings here, so we had to deal with lower ceiling heights. Very comfortable. This uh, building uh, was built in 1910, it used to make uh, uniforms for the U.S. military in both uh, World War I and World War II. In the concrete floor, you can actually see uniform buttons embedded into the concrete because it was a textile. All right, so there's our wine focal area. You can see a sneak peek of some barrel-aged cocktails. There are our wines. This is how we're doing the blending. This is our cheese and chocolate kitchen out in the dining room with a retail area. You can buy our cheese and take it home. You can see our cheese and chocolate tenders. If you, if you go by there and you say hello to one of them, they'll give you a sample. Hey, you want to try something? You can have a chocolate covered this or a piece of cheese and they'll engage in a conversation with you. Our fire focal turned into a candle focal because the fire department wouldn't let us do fire. And then we learned, then we learned the guests like the candles better. Uh, which was really good because that actually saved us about $50,000 going from fire to candles. And it's better. So better and, and less expensive, that's a win-win. Yeah. We're starting to use uh, wood tables more often. And I don't know if you can tell, but this is a party of four. We have two fondue pots and two cooktops on there. Most of our restaurants only have one cooktop on a party of four. So that allows the guests more ability to, to customize their dining. If they have two couples there, they can, they can have two different pots. Whereas right now, most of our restaurants, two couples have to share one pot. So that's Lover's Lane. Is a, this, we have an area of our restaurant full of romance. We call it Lover's Lane. Somebody sat in the Lover's Lane area. <laughs> Very private. You can go there. Um, and so we created the Lover's Lane here, too, behind the candle wall. Uh, people really like that. And then we did, we had to put something different on the outside of the building. So this is our current logo, and 99% of the melting pots. That's our new logo. What do you think? Fondue plus drink plus kitchen. 
Well, the reason why we had the kitchen, and, why, and also here's another one where we talk about the brunch, lunch, happy hour, and dinner. I'll do one more kind of uh, concept slide. This is the outside of the Memphis restaurant that never happened to be. We were bidding on a spot, and we didn't get it, but we did this concept for that where we designed that. We separated the pot from the logo. I don't know, that's a subtle difference. But right here, the pot is part of the logo, mm -hmm. right? This one is kind of off to the left. And then for our building signage, we treat it as art. The reason why we do that is because each, each city or state or municipality has very strict codes on how much, how big your sign can be. So this is art. This is a different requirement. This allows our melting pot to be a lot bigger because this is no longer part of the sign. It's now considered art. So our sign can get bigger and we can still meet the code. Little nuances like that. Very nice. So, but you still get, you know, we call this our iconic pot, right? So you still kind of get the, the, the vibe of it. All right, so again, you heard me say earlier that if we're gonna do all this great stuff, we're gonna open up for lunch, brunch, happy hour, we better have some menu offerings. And how do we address the guest who, the, although rare, how do we address the guest who doesn't want to cook their own food? So our chef, uh, amazing guy, Chef Jason Miller, uh, used to be the executive chef of Capitol Grill on Wall Street, worked with David Burke, who is a celebrity chef, owns a number of high-end restaurants around the world, um, was the personal chef for Ludacris. Yeah, I know, um, for a while. Worked in Miami at several very high-end restaurants. The guy is so talented. He is our executive chef, and he designed a number of things. But first, Paul Brown, our beverage manager, designed me. We reinvented our bar offerings because they were getting kind of old as well. So we're using things that are fresh. We're trying. I launched a what I call the Exceptional Food and Beverage Initiative back in 2015. And what we're trying to do is rid our food supply of 13 artificial ingredients, preservatives, and additives that are not good for you. And it's not easy to do that because we have to buy ingredients from food manufacturers and they don't always care about those things. So I'm happy to say in the first three years, we've eliminated seven out of 13 out of our food supply. So we're gonna, the remaining six are gonna be a little bit tougher. So a lot of these bar drinks that you have at, at different um, restaurants, you get really interesting flavors. They're really high in uh, fruit, fructose and lots of artificial flavors and ingredients and colors. And to do that in a fresh way is not always easy. That's why these companies produce those ingredients for ease of operation. But these are all using fresh and enhanced ingredients. Uh, this is our new signature Mai Tai. This is our new gin and tonic. Gin and tonic, I know you're guys like saying, what? what's so exciting about a gin and tonic? Let me tell you what's exciting about that. This thing is using a bottled soda water. We made our own tonic syrup that we mix with the soda water. That's all natural. Uh, and we put like five drops in a glass and then uh, four ounces of soda water. We put in uh, pickled juniper berries in here. We serve it in a wine glass, which is the traditional way of serving a gin tonic in Spain. This is the number one drink in, in Spain right now, is the gin tonic. Yes? So, like, so for example, on the gin and tonic then, because People don't realize tonics have a lot of calories. A lot of calories. So you've cut the calories probably in half because vodka more than half. gin is not that bad, right? Yeah, more than half. Definitely. So, so the flavoring works well. And it's all natural, 100% natural. Everything, there's no additives, no preservatives, no chemicals. It's 100% natural. This is our melting pot mule. Let's go back. This is our melting pot mule. We put it in a mule mug shaped like our fondue pot. Isn't that cool? Uh, I can't see. What is that? So the, that one's our freshly picked margarita. It's the first all-natural cocktail that we did. That's also the easiest. I don't know why more restaurants don't do that. We use only fresh juices for that. We don't use any margarita mix, no powder, no uh, roses, lime syrup, none of that stuff. We just, it was all fresh. We squeeze fresh juices for that every day. And it's, I mean, it's not, it's hard work, but it's easy, it's easy to do. This is our, um, this is our old fashioned. We actually implemented uh, two old fashioned, so a modern version with a twist um, that has this uh, Earl Grey bitters that we produce in it instead of the regular bitters. Our beverage manager, Paul, went to Louisville, Kentucky at a, a place called the Pendennis Club 
And that's the club more than 100 years ago that invented the old fashioned. So he toured there and talked to their bartenders and went to, to the uh, bourbon trail and, and talked to the bourbon makers of Kentucky and said, how, how do we make the best old fashioned? That's the kind of care. By the way, who wants his job? Wouldn't that be a great job to have? Traveling the world, mixing exotic cocktails for a living? I want that kind of job. But, um, but that's the link that we go to to make sure that we are taking you know, a modern twist on classic cocktails that meet our exceptional food definition of no preservatives or additives that we don't want. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. All right. So we have to also think about that guest who doesn't want to cook their own food at the table. It's less than 10% of our guests. But we could lose a lot more than 10% of our guests with what we call the veto vote. Has, everybody heard, has anybody heard of the veto vote? So you got a party, let's say there's four of you, and you're trying to decide where to go eat. And you start with this big long list and you start vetoing certain restaurants because one person doesn't like this, and one person doesn't like that, oh, I don't want steak tonight, I don't want Italian, I don't want Mexican. And you, and you start going down the list, and the next thing you know, you're just left with this really short list of restaurants and you pick from that. We want to be in that list more than we are today. So we said, okay, how do we do this? And, you know, we even though five people might love fondue, one person who doesn't love it will veto it for everybody. So we created these prepared entrees for that one person out of ten who doesn't like it. So in St. Petersburg, uh, that's one of our early adopters of this menu. There on Fourth Street, they're doing this menu right here, not. But they're doing this menu here in, in St. Petersburg, and we'll see that. We'll see a party of 10, and it's, and it's usually one person out of 10 who's eating one of these prepared entrees, and the rest of them are eating fondue. And it's usually an old guy <laughs> eating the prepared entrees. The younger people are eating the fondue because it's, it's new and, and cool. Uh, this is a chicken and waffle, and let me tell you, I, I'm a, I happen to be a chicken and waffle expert, and I can honestly tell you, Chef Jason has created the best chicken and waffle I've ever had. This is really good. This is a new cooking style that we've added. This is all restaurants um, across the country. We also are concerned about our calories that we offer our guests. And, and when you cook your own food at the table, there's really only a couple of ways to do that. One way, the traditional way of cooking your entree is with cholesterol-free canola oil. You're basically frying it at the table. What's good about that is it's a better flavor profile. It sears the outside of the meat and allows you to cook your steaks to temperature. If you like a medium rare steak, you can do that. The other way is we have three different flavored broths, right? We have one that's a mojo, which is a Caribbean-inspired, fresh juices and the like. Um, another one, which is a Coco Lawn, which has red wine and garlic and mushrooms, um, scallions in there. And another one that's just a vegetable bouillon for the purist who wants the food to shine through. It's just a lightly seasoned vegetable bouillon broth. But basically there you're boiling your own meat. And that's the objection a lot of our guests who, who object to cooking their food at the table. They don't like boiling their meat. It's traditional fondue, sure, but uh, some guests don't like that. So we uh, created the grill because People have moved away from the oil because it's just not very healthy. The calorie count when you cook it in the oil is, is substantially higher than the broth, but some people just don't like the flavor of boiled meat. So what do we do with that? Well, so we created this grill. We have all of these cooktops in the tables. So let's put the grill in there. So now people are actually grilling their food at their table. We've lowered the calorie count. You're able to sear your food. Uh, cook it any way you want to. You have total control over everything. It's fun. It's engaging. People have a really good time doing it. So that's that's why we introduced that. That actually was just introduced August 28th nationally. Yes, Patrick. Mike, so uh, the cooktops, are they induction then so they don't get hot? We have three different cooktops. Two are induction and one is a uh, regular cooktop that's under glass. But yeah, induction is the wave of the future. Our new cooktops that we just developed with the manufacturer, um, we did so at a lot less money than our previous versions. They're smaller. That's why we're able to get two in a table than we used to, because they used to be massive, but now they're much smaller. And we have to worry about safety of our guests, too, because if you're providing heat sources at a table, somebody could burn themselves. I mean, that's your point. So how do we, how do we provide safety? And we have all kinds 
of different ways of doing this is we take that, see that fine new pot, when that's, when that's full of 350 degree hot oil, how do we transport that from the kitchen back into the dining room and back from the dining room back into the kitchen safely where guests don't get burned, where our, our team members don't get burned? That would be a bad thing. So we've adapted and come up with several really unique inventions. We have, there was a manager in the 80s, his name was Paul Brommel, and he invented what is now today called, still to this day, called the Romulator, based <laughs> off of his last name. And it's a simple clamp device that goes over the top of that fondue pot and clamps that lid shut and has a rubber gasket, a high heat rubber gasket. So when you're, when you're carrying that pot, there is no spill whatsoever from the broth or the oil from inside of that pot. So we actually have fewer burns at Melting Pot than what we had at restaurants that I used to work at, like Outback Steakhouse or Ellen at Seafood Grill. Burns are very rare. I'm better than that kind of wood. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so that's the grill. Um, this is our four cheese panini. So if we're going to be open for lunch. You got to have a sandwich, but we don't want just an ordinary turkey sandwich. And we own cheese. By the way, the best cheese in the world literally is in this sandwich. In 2016, a company called Emmy Roth Kesa from Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, actually New Glarus, Wisconsin submitted their cheese, many of their cheeses, but one of their cheeses in the World Cheese Championship in Birmingham, England. It happens every other year. More than 3,500 participants from around the world. Usually Europe wins. Some country in Europe wins this, because Europe, I mean, they've been making cheese for hundreds of years. They've mastered it. In 2016, Emmy Rothkesa won the entire competition with their uh, Grand Cru Chachois, which is a really kind of a Gruyere cheese. And they won the best cheese in the world. And there's a little bit of that in there. And, and, there, and it's in two of our other cheese fondues. So we are li our cheese is not out of a can. It's not, you know, craft. We use artisan cheese manufacturers for, for melting pot. And it is high-end stuff. Best cheese, literally. In fact, we did a promotion called the best cheese in the world not long ago. So the we have the four cheese panini. This is literally the best grilled cheese you'll ever eat in your entire life. And yes, we have tomato soup on the menu as well for lunch. Brunch. Who would have thought that Melting Pot would be a viable brunch area? Well, we're doing it in St. Pete and in Sarasota. Early adopters, we have 20-something restaurants doing brunch today. So brunch is, um, this is the Alpine Benedict fondue. So most people, when you get a when you get an eggs Benedict, it's usually a poached egg with some sort of meat on an English muffin with hollandaise sauce on top of it, right? So how do we make that a fondue? Well, we put we put the cheese, right? We have a cheese fondue, which by the way has the best cheese in the world in this in this fondue. <laughs> we have we have freshly made scrambled eggs. We have Canadian bacon in here. We also have a half a cup of hollandaise sauce in there. So you get the flavor of the egg and the hollandaise sauce and the ham, and what you're dipping in it, what these are, are fresh croissants or English muffins. So you're actually using the English muffin to dip into it. And uh, last week in St. Pete, we sold more than 100 of these uh, in one Sunday. We'd never been open for brunch before because we didn't know we, we, could, we would have a compelling menu item, but people love this. Some of the other things we have on the menu is a another ham and Fontiago cheese panini, a burrata melon salad, so we use fresh watermelon and blanched asparagus and burrata with a balsamic vinaigrette on top of it. It's really good. Fig and goat cheese toast. This is probably the simplest thing. Everybody does avocado toast. Do you guys like avocado toast? Everybody does it. We do goat cheese toast. It's amazing with, with figs on it. Really good. Stuffed brioche beignets, the chicken and waffle it is on this menu as well. This is, a, this is really innovative, the, the oatmeal fruit brulee. So, what's the first, if you, who, does anybody here eat oatmeal? What's the first thing you add to it when you eat oatmeal? Honey. Huh? Honey. Honey, to sweeten it, right? Yeah. If you're healthier than most people, most people add lots of brown sugar, yeah. right? Or some sort of sugar, they sweeten it up. So we so said, how are we going to do that? Well, you know, our chef is really creative. So what he created was a dish where he actually brulees the top of the oatmeal. So we get that, like you have a cream brulee for dessert. 
you get that sugar brulee crispy topping on top of the oatmeal and then when you stir that in it just it's just so amazing to have that car that caramelized sugar on there like that it's really uh, outstanding wow i got through that quick um so that's our evolution well, i can talk a, a few minutes about about that and i think while i'm kind of wrapping that up let's let's um, i want to talk a little bit about culture first and i'll tell you a couple of stories but i want to also um, answer any of your questions because i like to answer questions one of the things when i when i was talking to bob and Mark johnson back in 2006 and trying to find out if i was interested in being a part of the company they told me that i interviewed them harder than they interviewed and the reason why I did that is because it was important for me to have the right cultural fit. I wanted, I wanted to make sure that my values aligned with the values of the company I was going to go to. So, and thankfully they did. Remember we were talking about the mission, vision, and principles, the, 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 the card that we have. Every, every Meltipot team member has it on their person all the time. I have one in my back pocket right now. So where we talk about it. And the reason why the culture is so important is you think about the training department cannot train a team member for every single situation that could occur in a restaurant. There's too many what ifs, right? You can, you, I mean, if you tried to train against every single what if situation in the world, the training manuals would be that thick, or your training time to go through training would be weeks and weeks and weeks. And who wants to sit through training before you start earning tips and you're only earning a training wage? So instead of trying to train every single scenario, we train our values so that when that situation happens to you as a team member at the multi body, you know how we're wired, you know what we believe, you know what we care about, and you already have the answer because you know what's important to our organization. And when you talk about culture, you're talking about <coughs> in teaching culture, you have to teach it in order to get it going in the restaurant or any business really for that matter. I've worked at organizations before, thankfully not Outback or, um, or Melting Pot, where they had beautiful posters on the wall that had all these great sayings, and they weren't really lived in the business. You know, people didn't really follow them, and, but they were catchy, you know, lots of corporate cliches, uh, and, and they didn't really mean a thing because it didn't translate into everyday life. So what's beautiful about Melting pot as it does. And what we do is we teach our culture to every single new team member. All of our managers from all of our restaurants across the world have to come to Tampa sometime in their first six months of employment, and they stay for three and a half days, and we teach them our culture there too, and a lot of other stuff. And it's important because how do you grow a culture? I mean, a culture, when you sign on the melting pot, you're basically making a commitment saying, hey, I want to follow this these standards. I want, to, I want to be a part of this team. I want to be a part of this culture. I, I'm committing to keeping this culture alive and, and, and following the values of this organization. So I think it's really important. You can't do that unless you know what they are. Right? If you're going to make a promise, you need to know what you're promising. I've been married for 25 years. And we can I can tell you, when I stood at that altar and made those promises to my wife before God, I knew what I was promising. I knew what I was getting into. And, and it was important to me. So I, you know, I think that when we teach these these cultures and these values to people, it's important that they are aligned with that. Now, that's, that doesn't mean a, a team member is a bad person if they're not aligned with the culture. If they're not, they're not really going to be a good fit. But I tell a story about <clears throat> a manager who was working in a restaurant one night and he saw a spill on the floor. So he grabbed the closest server to him, and it was this young guy. He told me the story. He's like, so I'm a millennial guy. Um, and he says, it's, and I just told him to you know, go wipe up that spill. So this manager was an older guy. Um, and he's, he, and the server says, this guy was a good server, but he was kind of rough around the edges. He, did, he wasn't real polished. And he says, well, why, why should I do that? It's not really my job to wipe up the floor. So here's this guy. He's his general manager of the restaurant. He asks this guy to do a simple task, and he's getting pushback from it. Now, as an older generation guy, you, you know, a lot, a lot of the older generation is all about sense of duty, don't question authority, just do it or you're done, right? You do it or you're fired. So the guy could have said, yeah, I don't care what you think, whether it's your job, just go do it. And maybe the team member would have done it that one time. But what this guy did, because he's one of my better general managers, 
is let me, let me explain something to you. Let me tell you why it's important. In our culture and in this organization, we care about our, our guests and we care about our fellow team members. And think about a guest who would walk by there and slip and fall on that and hurt themselves. And then they would maybe you know, tell all their friends about how irresponsible our restaurant was and would hurt our business. Or worse yet, even, what if a team member slipped and fell on that? And he told this, this server the story of a guy that worked there many years before who did actually slip and fall and threw out of his knee and was out of work for six months while he went through three different surgeries to repair his knee. Couldn't come back to work. And, you know, and he explained to the team member, you know, workers' comp pays for some things and will pay for some portion of your lost income, but it doesn't pay for everything. That guy, not to the fault of the restaurant, the restaurant was trying to get, get this server more money, but that server hurt his knee, actually had to file a personal bankruptcy because he couldn't pay his bills. So then the manager asked the server, how would you like to be the server who could have prevented that from happening but then chose not to? And the guy was listening to this general manager and said, yeah, you know, that, that all makes a lot of sense. So he spent five or six minutes explaining why it was important to have <coughs> that spill. Later in the shift, uh, the general manager was getting out of there. He was the early one out. He was at closing, and he wanted to say goodbye. As a good manager does, he says goodbye. He or she says goodbye to their team members before they leave. And he was searching this guy out specifically because he, he coached him during the shift, and he, he saw him from across the restaurant. He goes across the restaurant. As he gets closer, he realizes that guy's wiping up another spill. He didn't know anybody was watching. He had no idea that, that the general manager was seeking him out. He had no idea. But he was doing it on his own because he understood the why. He understood why it was important. He understood the values of the organization. If the general manager tried to just change the guy's behavior by making him do it, it would have worked one time. But what the general manager did, as any effective leader does, is he changed how that team member thought. And that change is forever. We don't have to explain that anymore to that team member. That's the last time. Yes, it took five or six minutes. It would have been really quick. But we say, hey, go do it right now. You're fired. That would have been instant. But he took five or six minutes to explain all of the lies. And he changed forever how this guy thought. And that guy ended up being an assistant manager. He ended up growing his career with that, with that uh, location. Because we had a really great leader there that explained to people the why. And that's what culture is, right? Does anybody know Simon Sinek? You've seen his, well, do me a favor. Google Simon Sinek and watch his TED Talk on Start With Why. It's a book also, but if you're like me, you'd probably rather see the TED Talk. But he explains it that you have to start with the why. You have to tell people what it is you're doing, but not just the what, you have to start with the why. If you think about, he, he explains in his TED Talks, and he's gonna, he does it so much better than I do, but he explains in his TED Talk, when, when you look at Microsoft, for instance, or let's say Hewlett Packard, any, any PC maker, when you look at a PC maker, they say, hey, do you wanna buy a computer? We make it this, and they go through all the specs and things like that. What Apple does is they say, hey, we want to make your life better. We want to have engaging software and, and hardware that's easy to use and making your life better. We happen to make computers to do that, one by one. So he starts with the why of what it is we're trying to do. We're trying to make people's lives easier and better. They happen to make, the, the, the how is they happen to make computers and then the last thing is, do you want to buy one? Every other computer manufacturer, they start with, want to buy one? They start with that first. So starting with why is all about organizational culture. I just did a, a speech about my grandfather, Clyde Baker, uh, to all of our franchisees. And I, I think about this, this guy. Um, Clyde Baker was in World War I. He survived. He was in the 1906 earthquake of San Francisco. He survived it. He lost his first wife in the Great Spanish Flu epidemic of 1917, but he survived it. He was in World War I. He, he was one of the first victims of modern-day chemical weapons because that's when the Germans first dropped mustard gas on our U.S. troops. And he suffered health uh, issues as a result of that all of his life. 
he um, was in a battle so brutal and large that he came down to hand to hand. They ran out of ammunition and they came down to hand to hand combat. He was only one of three survivors in his company of that battle. He came back to the United States as a troubled man from that from that war. The, the, the horrific things that he saw. And there was this period of time in his life where for 20 years he didn't know what kind of direction he wanted to take in life. This was during Prohibition, so we have pretty strong evidence that he was a bootlegger during that time. He would sell booze to people illegally. And some people even speculate that he was a moonshiner. He actually made some, too. I am from Kentucky, so that makes sense. A lot of moonshiners there. But, um, but there's a 20-year period of his life where it's kind of cloudy. Nobody really knows what he did because we think the guy was just really partying hard and, and just, just out there living life. But, you know, he wasn't happy. He wasn't his best self. And ultimately, he met my grandmother later in life. They had the miracle baby, my mom, when my grandmother was 43 years old, which was really unheard of back then, much more common today. And then he changed. And then, then he became this, this guy that started supporting his community. In his community, he started the first 4-H club, the first Boy Scouts, the first Christmas light display. He started the first um, uh, 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 the, the first Rotary Club. Uh, he helped charities. He, did I say Little League? He also started the first Little League in town. All of those things that he started are still going on to this day. He helped build a church. He helped build people's houses. Um, he took electricity to the first time to some farms in western Kentucky. Back then, only three, when he first started, only 3% of the farms in western Kentucky actually had electricity. And he, he brought electricity, ran lines. His company ran lines, and he would go inside and wire people's homes. And he did that. The guy had tons of values. And you think I know a lot about this guy, and that, that I was really close with him as a relative. And I do know a lot about him, but I really don't know him because he died when I was two. So that's what culture is, because I learned about him through stories from my grandmother and my mom and his, his friends that survived him, and they would tell all of these amazing stories about the, what his values were. My mom, because my grandfather ta taught her to, cared about giving back something worthwhile, cared about giving back to society. She loved it. She became a social worker. She ran a homeless shelter for six years. She helped Vietnam vets readjust to uh, coming back from Vietnam when they came back from the war. She's still, uh, uh, today she teaches uh, anger management classes. She's still helping people into her 70s. My sister, because of what she saw from my mom, who saw what she saw from my grandfather, my sister is also a social worker. And she chose a really rough life because she is a child welfare, was a child welfare investigator and her, her situation when she had to remove kids from troubled homes. Um, so she did good work, but it was very stressful. All of that, though, started with my grandfather. Those values and principles that kind of came down from him. So what does that have to do with an organization? Well, the same kind of values can come down in an organization from the top down by telling stories, by sharing the culture, by sharing your values. You can really affect how people think, like that manager, right? The manager who ta taught that person why it's important to wipe up that spill. You can change how they think, which is much more powerful than changing how they act. That's what culture is. You're changing how people think. And that's really critical. That was the last little bit I wanted to talk about uh, culture. So I think we have, I don't know how many, much time. My timer says about 20 minutes for questions. So who has some questions that I can answer? How was some of the training that you did to make sure that the culture was aligned with yours, your franchise, and your teams? Say that one more time. I heard culture. How, how was the training that you did to like teach values and the culture? What kind of training was it? We, well, first thing we did is we developed some online training. Uh, we did some videos. We recorded videos of our team members who have experienced some of the culture. Some of the best ways to teach this stuff is just by telling stories. I like you can tell I've told several stories today. So we wanted to make sure storytelling is a big part of that. Just like I told stories about my grandfather, telling stories about our culture and what it means uh, to folks and how we demonstrate that in real life. So it's not just a beautiful poster on the wall that people can see our values alive and well in, in the hearts and minds of our fellow team members. So that's how we do that. Yes? 
I have two questions from online viewers. Beautiful. Uh, one person is working for a hotel chain mm -hmm. who does franchising. Mm -hmm. So she says that um, I was wondering, does the franchisee, uh, franchisees can provide the real quality of the company that they carry the brand? Uh, she adds that she works for a hotel that's managed by the chain. Mm -hmm. And when she goes to the hotels that's franchisee, franchising, she says that the quality is terrible. Right. So she's asking, how do you ensure that the melting pot owned by the company is the same experience as the franchisee? Okay, so I'll just kind of repeat the question. Uh, this person online works for a, a, a hotel brand and the, the unit that she's in is, is managed and owned by the company. But when she visits uh, franchise locations that's not operated and owned by the company, the quality is, is greatly diminished, I'm paraphrasing. Yep. So, you know, I get that's, that is the, the number one thing in a chain environment, right? So we, we have chain restaurants, chain retail stores, chain hotels. Um, there are the nature of any team there's always stronger players and weaker players. And so what you have to do is you have to make sure that your weakest player is still above the line of what's considered acceptable. Um, in our business, the restaurants who thrive are the ones who follow the standards the most. We have something that we call the success formula where we, we, we kind of grade our franchisees on a variety of things, like business planning, marketing planning, uh, QC standards, food quality standards, service standards, team member satisfaction, all these different things, and we kind of put them in a matrix, and it kind of spits out a ranking uh, of them, and it kind of says, okay, well, they're green, that means they're following all the standards. Then when we overlay what their sales increases and decreases have been for the last five years, there's a correlation. The restaurant, even during the recession when all restaurants were struggling, our best performing restaurants still had sales increases. So, you know, as a franchisor, we can't allow those those branches, those units to not perform well. So, you know, we have had the unfortunate responsibility of terminating some of our partnerships. We've had to close down some of those locations. Uh, thankfully, we have a very passionate group of franchisees, and that's not happened very often. Our, our franchisees are the most amazing. I'm going to stack our franchisees up against any group of franchisees anywhere in the world because they're amazing. They care about the brand. They're passionate about the brand. They want to represent. If somebody falls below a standard that's not intentional, it's because maybe the manager or they had a bad day or a bad shift. And our, our job then, when it's a, just an honest human mistake, our job is to help them correct it. Okay, fine, you, you've not met the standard. Now let's work together so that you, you can meet it uh, consistently in the future. So that's what we do. If, yeah. There's a question here. You I got a question? Oh, yes. How often do you uh, check those ratings? Like, could, could you say a uh, bad shift or a bad day? Like, is, that, is it that fine a point? Well, uh, the question was, how often do we check those ratings? Uh, if somebody has a bad shift or a bad day, is at that final point? Really what I was referencing is when we are in the restaurants and we happen to see a bad score, maybe it's because they're just happen to, they just happen to have a bad shift or one of their team members just wasn't taught properly or something. It just could be a blip on the radar. However, your question about how often do we check, you know, we're not in the restaurant every single day. We, we trust our franchise owners to run their restaurants responsibly. So we're in the restaurant several times a year, inspecting and consulting with them and providing them guidance and helping them you know, run their businesses more effectively. But you know, with social media today and the fact that we have online surveys, last year we had more than 90,000 online surveys filled out from Melting Pot guests. It's, even if we're not in the building, we can go on TripAdvisor and see if somebody's following their standards or not. It's pretty, just like a guest can do that, we can too. Here. All right, this one first, and then Patrick second. Okay. I work in a country club, and when I'm not running a tennis center, I'm a server in the food and beverage department, mm -hmm. and my manager lacks a lot of those essential morals and values, and I was just wondering what I, as an employee, can do to make sure that I work the way I want to work when management is lacking. 
So uh, her question was, what, what to do when her supervisor doesn't have the same values that she does, and what can she do about it? Well, you know, it's kind of funny. I read, uh, I don't know why, it was just a habit. From the time I was old enough to read, I used to read the comics every single day. And on the comics are the Dear Abby's and the, the other one. And, and there's one, there's an employment one on the business section on Sundays that talks about that too. And unfortunately, when you when you have a supervisor that's not aligned in values, your your options are limited because they're the supervisor. But when I say limited, that means it's not that you have zero options, you just have fewer options. So the, the options, sometimes the manager just needs to have some reverse coaching. Does anybody know what the term reverse coaching is? It's where you lead up. <laughs> Leading is not going down all the time. It's sometimes it's lateral, side to side with your peers, but also you can lead up. And you, you have the ability of, of managing up. I had a difficult supervisor one time. I bought every book in the, in the bookstore on how to manage up because I could not figure this guy out. So, I mean, I really studied. It actually helped me. It really did help me deal with him. And you might do something similar to that. But when you talk about that, you could ask him the why, or he or she the why, and say, help, help me understand why we're doing that. And, and, and then, you know, not in a rude or um, inappropriate way, but, you know, sometimes just asking simple uh, quizzical questions like that will help guide them on there. And then, and then, you know, maybe even a sit down one-on-one. -on -one. This doesn't seem right. Help me understand why, and I always phrase it like, help me understand. I'm seeking to understand, I'm not judging. I'm seeking to understand why this is it, why this is good values for us to do this for our guests or how we do this or how we do that. And uh, it's a bold move. It takes a certain kind of person to do that. I've been in that role before. I've had to do that. Part of the motivation of doing the focus groups on where you should head was the focus groups having done them in the restaurants was part of the motivation there to involve the franchisees and I'd say absolutely our franchisees are so important to us and we really do I use the word and I use this seriously I revere our franchisees I have deep respect for our franchisees our franchisees are spending more than a million dollars of their own money in putting that kind of faith in our brand so I take my responsibility as the brand president to honor their trust and faith in us. I take that super seriously. I can't fail them. I don't want to fail them. Um, so I take that very, very seriously. So we try to involve them, and you know, we we, uh, we try to be transparent along every step of, of the way. And um, and so yeah, that was part of it. The other part of it, though, and, and truthfully, I'll be candid, the bigger part of it in this particular case is the fact that we wanted to walk the guests around to different areas of the restaurant. We would tell them, sit at that table and tell us what you think. Sit at that table, sit, tell us what you think. Sit at the bar and tell us what you think. What do you see? What's important for you? And then we would give them a menu and say, okay, if you're sitting here and you have this menu, what would you order? And our, our facilitator, this guy is a pro, uh, he got so much great information out of these guests as they were in the environment of the melting pot. If they're not there, his theory as our consultant was, how can they properly judge a building or environment if they're not actually in it? They're gonna, they might remember two years ago, right, from the last time they visited. But some of our, some of the people that we had in there were never tried. They've never been inside of the melting pot. So we had to bring them in and say, okay, now that you're here, what do you think? What, how would you use us? I think I saw another question over here. Yeah. Yes. You have one more online? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah online. online. Yeah. Um, one viewer said, I see that all these restaurants have different settings, lights, colors, layout. Why is it? Okay. You so, just touch in a little bit, but... Yeah, sure. And then there's a second part of the question, but I will ask you after you answer this one. Yeah, I, I can actually, I have a whole PowerPoint deck on our unique restaurants that we have under the Melting Pot and Prava. One of the things we like to do is we like to go into a geographic area and go in, into a building or a space that's kind of unique. And we have some really unique restaurants. 
The inside, we, you know, we used to do in all kinds of different color schemes and patterns and fabrics and things like that. But as we move forward, what you saw here in Red Bank, that's pretty much what the inside is going to look like. The outside and how it's put together, the in, even the inside, how it's laid out, and what tables go where, that's going to vary from location to location. But we don't build a lot of freestanding melting pots. We usually go into some pre-existing structure or shopping center. We have a restaurant in north of San Francisco in Larchburg, California, that's in an old brick kiln. Literally, the walls are 10 foot thick. Where, because they used to, they used to fire these bricks, and they actually rebuilt San Francisco from that earthquake that my grandfather survived. They, they made the bricks there to rebuild San Francisco. So it's a donut because they would have the fire in the center, and then the bricks would be on the inside. We have one in, a, in an old city hall in, uh, outside of Denver called Littleton, Colorado. It's our highest volume restaurant. And it's such a cool space. There's a basement where the jail used to be. And so we actually have those walls where the, the bars used to be. There's tables. You can actually eat dinner in a jail cell. <laughs> and we do, haunt, it's kind of creepy when you think about it, but uh, we also do haunted uh, tours there as well. Uh, people love that. Even our spot in St. Pete, uh, when you go look at that, that was a building that was built in the early 1900s by a carpenter who would sell wooden purses to the tourists. And uh, we're in that building too, and it has a very unique look and feel to it. So we like to adapt our brand to, to unique spaces, but you're going to see more consistency on the inside as far as the design and finish go. You were kind of, I mean, from a building perspective, we're kind of the anti chain chain because all of our buildings are different. And he's adding. Uh how easy is it? Is it easy? How easy is it to portray a strong brand image with such a diverse set of service cape? How easy is it to to to, uh, uh, to a portray brand, a strong brand image? A strong brand image when when your design is so different diverse. things. Um, they all still have the same look and feel. They all have the same shape tables. They all have the same service style. Our service is very meticulously consistent. Our food offerings, we do actually offer local favorites in different markets. For instance, if you're in Louisville, Kentucky, you would get a bourbon bacon cheddar there. That's not, I mean, bourbon's big in Kentucky. It's not big everywhere. Um, in New England, we have an Old Bay crab cheddar. I'm sorry, Swiss, an Old Bay crab Swiss. Crab and Old Bay seasoning is very, very specific to that area. So we do have some local interest on our menus, but our style of serve, our consistency comes with the experience, not necessarily the design of the building. That's it for me. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Thanks. The time the is over. You had? No, no, no. I was about to ask the same question. I was following the online. Oh, okay. Online, yeah. Very good. Did you have another one? Me? Yes. Um, yeah, actually. So the local favorites and all that, how does that conform to like the regulations and stuff? Like is are there regulations about how to add a local favorite or does like the corporate need to okay every local favorite? Yeah, in fact, we create the local favorites. Um, okay. So if a franchisee in Maryland, for instance, the Old Bay, they have an idea that's like, hey, we want to celebrate our heritage and of Old Bay seasoning help us create something, we were thinking about this and this and this, they might submit a recipe, but it goes through an approval process. Usually we'll tweak it or, and we'll put it into our software. We also have to worry about you know, uh, nutrition analysis and we also have to worry about the exceptional food initiative. So if they've chosen an ingredient that has an additive in it that doesn't meet our list of chemicals and food, pres food preservatives that we're trying to do away with, we won't allow it. We just won't, allow we were not putting anything new on our menu that doesn't adhere to that exceptional food initiative. Um, and we're taking some old things off of the menu that doesn't either. But it goes through a process where we approve it. So, for instance, in some areas of the menu we allow a lot of uh, flexibility, like cheese fondue. Each restaurant has six cheese fondues on their menu. Three are on every restaurant in the country. And then three of the local restaurants are allowed to pick from a list of approved recipes. But again, we want to be the anti-chain chain because we, we really do have local owners, so we want to make sure we're celebrating the, the profiles and the, and the preferences, food, beverage, and otherwise of, of the local community. Any other questions? Thank you. Good.
Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Sure. Okay, so this says Certificate of Appreciation is awarded as presented to Mr. Mike Lester for delivering this distinguished service uh, lecture entitled Entrepreneurship in the Restaurant Industry at the lecture series of the M3 Center for Hospitality, Technology, and Innovation, October 17th. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Students. Oh, very nice. Oh, nice. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much. If you just come here, can you go there, please? Take a picture. There are lines. Oh, you can do it like this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, here. So that the, the, the light doesn't come. Right. Right. Yeah. Here you go. So can we have a group picture all together as well with my students? You can do it. I hope they can just like should we go there? Maybe that's easier. Yeah, go there. Yes. Go there. Yes. You can see yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Uh, you don't Thank go. you all. Just stay for a second. Let's take a group picture. If you want to come together, yeah, you can close it. Finish.